Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us for our launch of our report on animals and people experiencing domestic and family violence. Um, we'll be starting very shortly. We're just waiting for a few more people to join us. Perfect. Um, would you like to open the session, Delia? Thank you, will do. Hey everyone. Before I begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land we meet on and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. I'm on the land of the Gadigal people of the Aura Nation and note wherever we are across Australia, we meet on Aboriginal land. My name is Delia Donovan. I'm the proud interim CEO of Domestic Violence New South Wales. We're a peak body for specialist domestic and family violence services across regional, rural and metro New South Wales. Thank you so much for joining us today as we launch our report on animals and people experiencing domestic and family violence. It's truly wonderful to have such a diverse group with us here today, including domestic violence sectors, government and animal welfare sectors. I also understand we're welcoming colleagues from New Zealand here today, so a huge welcome. So why are we here today, everyone? We're here today because we all believe that people and animals experiencing domestic and family violence deserve to be safe. We also recognise that animals are victim survivors. This is clear from the research we will share with you today. Perpetrators can use violence against women, sorry, violence against animals, I should say, to exert, and women, to exert power and control over partners and family members during the relationship and after separation. The three highest risk factors for domestic violence homicides are access to weapons, suicide threats, and threats to kill or harm animals. This is also the reason why we've undertaken this really important sector research to highlight how the safety and well being of animals and people experiencing domestic and family violence are absolutely interconnected. Now, moving to our agenda. It is my pleasure to introduce the Honourable Mark Speetman, Attorney General and Minister for the Prevention of Domestic Violence. We've shared a lot of our research findings with the Minister, his team and the Department who have been working on a number of initiatives, which I'm sure we'll hear about next, to improve the safety and well-being of people and animals experiencing domestic and family violence. Thank you, Minister. Can you see me? We can't yet. <laughs> hang on, hang on. There you can. There you are. Hello. Hello. Welcome. Just hang on a sec. Yeah, that's better. Um, thank you, Delia. Thanks for that introduction. Thanks, everyone, um, for this opportunity to say a few words. Um, I also acknowledge I'm on the, the land of the Gadigal of the Eora Nation, and I pay my respects to elders past and present of all the uh, Aboriginal lands on which uh, we variously gather today. Uh, congratulations, DP New South Wales, on this incredibly important launch today. I think um, uh, animal abuse has been under-recognised as a form or a, or a um, part of uh, domestic and family violence uh, for a long time. And I think uh, this, what you have put together today uh, will be a very important resource for, for legislators, um, not only in New South Wales, but across Australia, and uh, not just legislators, but, but policy makers, uh, as well. Um, I, I know as an animal lover, um, the comfort I get from having had dogs most of my life. Uh, there's an old saying, if you want a friend in politics, get a dog. And I know what uh, enormous um, uh, emotional comfort a, a, a companion animal gives, gives to people. Um, and, and that would be even more so uh, for victim survivors of domestic and family violence who've been incredibly traumatised uh, and can get some um, uh, emotional, emotional support uh, from con a continued relationship with a companion animal, which is why preserving that connection between a victim survivor uh, and their companion animals uh, is so important. Uh, we know that uh, it's quite common for victim survivors not to leave an abusive situation or to delay leaving an abusive situation because they're concerned about what will happen uh, to their companion animals. 
uh, and we know that um, uh, it is quite common for uh, perpetrators of uh, d domestic abuse generally uh, to use animals uh, as, a as a form of abuse, uh, typically an incident of, um, of coercive control. And of course, as I think most or all of the um, viewers or participants in today's um, uh, launch will know um, we've announced, uh, we've launched a parliamentary inquiry into coercive control, uh, and the possible criminalisation of that and other legal responses and policy responses to criminal co uh, coercive control. And that'll be reporting uh, back to the both houses of parliament uh, in June next year. Uh, at the moment, um, we have a bill before parliament to recognise uh, animals explicitly in as a st uh, their protection as a standard condition of apprehended domestic violence orders. And I thank uh, DV New South Wales for, for their uh, input in that. I also, I also acknowledge the work of Emma Hurst from the Animal Justice Party, who has been a very strong advocate in, in this area and, and has held uh, uh, seminars and engaged in extensive consultation uh, herself. Um, the other thing uh, we're doing at the moment is um, the pause program. Um, there's $500,000 from COVID stimulus money uh, grants. Uh, it's a grant uh, application uh, scheme. Uh, applications close on the 20th of November and there'll be two streams. There'll be uh, one stream for uh, women's refuge and, as and so on to, uh, to adapt their facilities to care for companion animals. Uh, and the other stream will be for existing animal welfare organisations to um, uh, to I expand their ability to uh, deal with uh, companion animals that are fleeing domestic and uh, family violence. Uh, look, that certainly isn't the end of either legislative reform necessarily, or probably more importantly, uh, policy reform. Uh, there are certainly ideas that I'll be interested in from uh, this paper today that I'll be very interested in, in looking at, in particular, uh, the ability of the social housing uh, to uh, accommodate um, uh, uh, victim survivors fleeing domestic and family violence who want to keep their companion animals. I've, I've seen in the research that you've done uh, an extraordinarily high uh, incidence of those fleeing domestic and family violence who've got difficulties finding suitable accommodation uh, with their companion animals. Uh, training, uh, making sure those outside the, the DV sector itself um, understand the, the complexities and can spot the signs of domestic and family violence. Uh, and further cross training between vets, police, and so on. So there are a lot of um, uh, great ideas out of this uh, paper that um, we're, we're already working on, and I'll, there'll be more. I'll have more to say probably won't be before Christmas now, but um, early next year hopefully. And uh, I'm, I'm really grateful for all this uh, this important work that you've done. So thanks for the opportunity to say a few words, and congratulations. That's it. Thank you so much, Minister, for making the time to share. Um, Sorry, go on. That's it. Awesome. <laughs> well, thank you for sharing that very important shopping list of uh, things that you're working on and things that we continue to look forward to working on with you. Um, it's really important for us to hear about the initiatives that government are undertaking. Um, and everybody, we encourage those that can to apply for a grant um, and we'll share some information about that following the event today. Um, and also we're really keen to see how um, the impacts of the ADBOs are introduced and how you know, learning from the insights of the impacts of those reforms and how people and um, animals experiencing domestic and family violence feel those effects. Um, it's also now moving on to the agenda of absolute great pleasure to introduce the incredible Tali Starr. She is a survivor advocate of domestic and family violence, has a huge amount of experience and expertise to share with us today, was on the Domestic Violence New South Wales Voices for Change programme, and I really look forward to hearing her story and expertise now. Thank you, Tali. Hi, thank you. Um, I've brought my show and tell with my cat here. <laughs> so she's making a little appearance. You'll see her tail probably more than anything else. Um, I just want to thank you so much for the privilege to speak at this. Um, I feel like I'm a bit of the accidental activist um, because when I got the question, does anyone have anything they could contribute to this discussion? I said, well, I could say a few things. And then during the process of that, I learned there was much more to it than what I had realised. And I think that's one of the problems in that we do not understand the connection between domestic and family violence and animal abuse and how closely linked they are. And for me, I remember thinking about the studies showing that lethality was a really big indicator in animal abuse and thinking, no, that's not my story. And then reflecting further to prior to my birth, 
um, my family actually tried to get rid of me, or my father did. And that is, and then there was also animal abuse. So the two started to connect the dots for me. Um, I find this topic actually quite difficult to talk about because animals are just so precious to us. They are our safe place to fall. They're our place to feel like we know that we've got somewhere to go. And in a family that I grew up in, which was incredibly violent, that was my safe place to go. And I needed to have my animals around me to survive it basically. And when I was younger, we moved to a very uh, violent area of Australia and I was exposed to horrendous abuse, uh, both outside the home and inside the home. And I don't talk about it very much because I think one of the problems is that we look at the extreme violence and we say, oh, that's domestic and family violence, but we miss all the coercive control that goes on beforehand. And we miss all the different signs that we could be picking up on that we could actually help women, children and victims prior to these really violent events. And so I'm bringing them up today because I think they're important to know because animal abuse is one of the most horrendous things a child can witness, but also an adult. And when I was a child in this very unsafe area, I was exposed to um, witchcraft, I was exposed to um, extreme forms of violence, and it was such a scary place that police didn't go. I was recently reflecting on the koala situation and um, I remember watching the television and thinking, please, please to this koala, don't walk into the fire. And I had a very strong reaction and I couldn't understand why I had such a strong reaction. And then I was given a, um, a document which had a picture of animals done in yellow and red and um, hot colors. And I remember thinking, oh, I can't cope with that. It makes me think of an animal on fire. And then slowly over time, I was able to understand that actually that was what I witnessed as a child. And so that was part of the animal abuse. That was part of setting up all that coercive control so that I would not speak up about what was going on at home, uh, that I would, be, um, I would be negated in what I was saying because it was so extreme, who would believe it? And it was a way that they kept the family under wrap. And I think those kind of things are important to talk about. And the fact that that then led to my brother being part of the coercive control of the family and um, my father using him to continue the abuse. And then he took up that banner and kept going with it. And so that whole system of coercive control really does cause so much damage to people. And when I was looking at a photo, when I was doing some of my healing, I looked at a photo of a bird that I used to have and the story around my birds was they just kept dying. Birds only last for about six months. And this kind of didn't make sense to me, but I didn't really know what to say about it until one day I saw this photo of my bird and I just had a huge emotional reaction to it. And then through the process of working through that, I remembered that my, uh, my brother had actually taken the bird out, sorry, trigger warning, um, and snapped its neck. And I think these kind of things get buried in our psyche because they are so horrific to remember. But I didn't forget that there was abuse. I just had to block out some of those really horrendous things. And I think what I wanna to say to you is this is a solvable problem. We don't need to have children suffering like this. We don't need to have adults suffering in these situations. And we can do something about it. And I'm very excited about the bill that's been proposed. I think it's an incredible uh, possibility to start tackling some of these things. And what I would say is we need to go broader than that. And we need to change systems. We need to educate and train people to know the signs, what to look out for. In my marriage, I thought my husband was not any ab abusive person at all. And he was gentle, he was kind, he was the kind of person that if they were having a party, people would say, if, is he going to be there? Okay, you can have the party. But he, abuse was much more subtle, much more covert, involved accidents around the animals. I recently remembered, I used to say to him, please don't, don't brush them so rough, it's going to hurt them. So it was things like that where you couldn't really put an exact thing on it. He would get into my face. He would make me feel uncomfortable. I would feel stressed. And 
he would yell at me and my animals would get highly stressed and they'd throw up and they'd run around and they'd escape. And I would ask him to please don't speak like that. Look at how it's affecting them, but it wouldn't change his behavior. And so I think this is what we've got to look out for. We need to have police who can come into situations and go, how's your animals in this situation? I've noticed that your animal's limping. Did they injure themselves? What happened? Like ask the questions, don't just ignore it. Look at the whole picture and not just one bit of it. And I think if I had had the ambulance officers come when I was a child and said, hey, this has happened a couple of times now that we've had to come out. What's going on here? And I would be standing at the door <laughs> as a five-year-old saying, no, he didn't injure it by accident. He threw a shoe at them. And so these are the signs you've got to listen to. Children will tell you. Children by their behaviour will tell you. Women will tell you. And we need to start listening to that. If I'd had a when I left my uh, partner, if I'd had somewhere to go that I felt safe, that I could talk to, that I could take my animals with, I would have, it would have been a different story for me. I don't think I would have been homeless. I think if there were rental properties that were affordable that I could take my animals, I would have had safety when I left and time to heal instead of the further trauma that I experienced through all of the systems. And if I'd had an opportunity to have um, people come and actually understand my whole picture and what was happening and what was important to me. I think that would have made a huge difference as well. And it, one of the things that um, I had said to me was, well, if you just give up your animals, you'll be fine. You'll be able to find a rental property. Well, one that's ridiculous in terms of the fact that there aren't rental properties that people can afford, especially along low incomes. And two, there's just no, way you can part with something that is your family. I don't have family, my animals are my family. And during that horrendous time after leaving, that was my way to actually come through. On those mornings when I used to go, I don't wanna wake up tomorrow. I just want to stay asleep forever. My animals were the first thought that came into my head and it was a case of no, because if I don't wake up, they have no one to look after them. So they kept me going. It was hard because we moved so many times because it was so unsafe. And each time I moved, I had to, they were injured by other animals or they were in situations that they had to go more to the vet and I couldn't afford vet bills. I couldn't afford um, a places to live. I couldn't afford to eat. At times I was feeding my animals more than I was actually being fed myself. And I couldn't work out why I felt so faint all the time. But the thing was, my animals were just so important to me. If I didn't have them, I would not have made it through. And if I had people had looked and seen what was happening in all of my situations, they would have understood that this was a bigger situation than I was in. And the problem for me was I had also got disabilities and finding disability friendly places with animals was almost impossible. I remember talking to the Salvation Army and they said, look, you could go to a refuge. And the ref, I didn't think I needed one because I didn't fully understand that I was actually in domestic family violence with my um, ex-partner. But when I spoke to them, they said, no, you have to give up your animals. When I spoke to the RSPCA at that stage, there was nothing to support people. I would have had to surrender them. When I was homeless and my animals were, one was killed and one died, I had nowhere to bury them. I had nowhere to put them. I had no home, I had no finances, and there was no system to support me. And what I'm saying to you is we need to change these systems. We need to put things in place so that animals are looked after. And that means that people are looked after. And if we deal with um, putting things like on the ADVO animals, I think that's gonna make a huge difference because they're not property and they're not things that can just be shafted around and they are an important part for children and they are an important part for um, adults as well. And I think this is a non-partisan 
thing. We cannot make this political. DV cannot be political. It has to be about the safety of people and it has to be about the safety of our animals. And I just want to really um, applaud the things that have been done. I have been so privileged to be part of the round table. And I think we need to keep involving all voices in this discussion. And we need to keep developing it further because when we do, we are going to solve this problem. And we are committed to solving this problem. And no woman, no victim, no animal should ever have to face what I or any others have had to face. So I want to thank you so much for this time. So incredibly powerful and moving. And I said you were incredible and in that you are, Tali. Thank you so much for that really important story. And I just want to flag a couple of things you mentioned and just support them that we need to think about cultural reform, system reform, along with any law reform. Um, but it's really important that we start thinking about the barriers and the things that you've listed in that um, story. And I really, really thank you for sharing such a moving story with us all. And I think we're all raring to go. And there's been a lot happening in the chat box, everyone, so do continue to use that. Um, moving on very briefly, and thanks again, Tali. Um, I just want to share a couple of thank yous and um, let you know a few things around um, what we've been doing with the, with the report and who's been involved. So we're really excited to let you know um, that there's been a number of people involved in putting this report together and a number of people we'd like to thank. We'd like to thank our intern, Tina, um, who's worked with us on the survey, the research and the report. We'd like to thank, thank the UTS students, Emily, Florence, Eileen, Crystal and Liesl for your wonderful design on the report. Thank you so much for showing us these great templates and uh, images. And we hope that everyone enjoys seeing how they've made the report look. We'd like to thank again, Tali and Jake also for generously sharing their stories and expertise. It's been unbelievable to have those insights woven into our report and our story, which I think makes it really powerful. We'd like to thank domestic and family violence and community workers who shared their insights throughout our surveys. Partner organisations whose expertise really informed the report include Note of Violence, Lucy's Project, RSPCA New South Wales, Safe Pets, Safe Family South Australia, EDVOS Victoria, Women's Legal Service New South Wales and the Tenants Union New South Wales. Thank you again, wonderful organisations partnering with us. We'd like to thank Yasmin, Kate and Lucian at the New South Wales Department of Communities and Justice for engaging with us in their work and really involving us in the government re review, the grants and the law reform. So big thanks from us. I'd now like to introduce Monique Dam, our Advocacy and Prevention Manager at DV New South Wales. And I'm really excited about seeing this as well um, to share with us all the findings from the report and the recommendations. And I wanna thank Monique for all her work in leading and coordinating this work for Domestic Violence New South Wales. Thank you so much, Monique. Thank you so much, Delia. And I would also like to echo our thanks to all of you who contributed to our report and who have been working so hard to improve the safety of animals and people experiencing domestic and family violence. Before I begin, I would also like to acknowledge and pay my respects to the traditional owners of the beautiful lands on which we are living across New South Wales, Australia and New Zealand. I am on Darug land. Sovereignty was never ceded and this will always be Aboriginal land. I would also like to acknowledge elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to First Nations colleagues with us today. My name is Monique Dam, and I am the Advocacy and Prevention Manager at DV New South Wales. Thank you so much to all of you for taking the time to join us today, and I hope you'll share the report through your networks so we can keep these conversations going. In July 2020, DV New South Wales conducted two surveys on animals and people experiencing domestic and family violence to ascertain and draw on the knowledge of workers supporting victim survivors and working with perpetrators to change their behavior. Over a hundred domestic and family violence workers uh, supporting victim survivors and seven men's behavior change programs and perpetrator interventions uh, workers responded to our survey. Uh, could we please go to the next slide, Pip? And I also really wanted to acknowledge our Pip and Renata from DV New South Wales who are helping with all the IT support. Um, so as I mentioned, responses were received from across metropolitan and regional New South Wales 
from all New South Wales Department of Communities and Justice Districts, except the Far East and Murrumbidgee. Most of the findings that I'll share with you today are based on the survey of domestic and family violence and community workers working with victim survivors, since that uh, survey received significantly more responses. You can find the results of the survey of men's behaviour change program workers in the report. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? So whenever you see, uh, whenever you see percentages referred to in this presentation and in the report, this means the percentage of workers who responded to the specific survey question. And whenever you see N equals, that just refers to the number of workers who responded to that particular survey question as workers could skip questions if they wished. So what kinds of animals are victim survivors connected to? 32% of domestic and family violence and community workers said they have worked with victim survivors who were connected to assistance animals. This highlights the importance of ensuring that people with disability experiencing domestic and family violence can access the supports they and their animals need to be safe. Domestic and family violence and community workers stated that victim survivors have been connected to a whole range of animals, including dogs, cats, large animals such as horses, small mammals like rabbits and guinea pigs, reptiles, fish, as well as birds, pigs and wildlife. 81% of workers said that victim survivors have disclosed the perpetrator threatened to harm or kill animals. And 55% of workers said victim survivors have disclosed the perpetrator killed an animal or animals in the context of domestic and family violence. It should be taken into account that 5% of workers who responded to the survey never ask about animals experiencing violence in conversations with clients, 17% rarely ask, and 23% ask sometimes. So this may have increased the incidence of victim survivors not disclosing the violence perpetrated against animals to those workers. Workers said that victim survivors have disclosed many types of violence perpetrated against animals, including threats to harm or kill, hitting, neglect, kicking, exposure to violence, verbal abuse, emotional abuse, burning, drowning, and also um, electrocuting, skinning alive, strangulation, shooting, bludgeoning, poisoning, drugging and stealing. Um, and I just wanted to pause there for a moment and it's, uh, it is really difficult to talk about all these forms of violence against animals. So if you are feeling um, triggered or would like to talk to anyone in the chat box, um, there are details about the New South Wales Domestic Violence Line that you can call um, if you are experiencing domestic and family violence or have experienced violence. We asked workers about the impacts of domestic and family violence against animals on people, including children. And workers told us they have witnessed a range of uh, impacts of animals experiencing domestic and family violence on people, including trauma, psychological harm, emotional harm, physical harm, delays in leaving, financial costs of veterinary treatment, and impacts on children in particular included long-term trauma, not wanting to disclose the violence for fear that they will leave the pet or leave their animals, and also perpetrating violence that they have witnessed perpetrated against the animals. When we asked workers about the impact of domestic and family violence against animals on, pe and on people, something that we did not specifically ask about emerged. Workers noted the really important role of animals in providing feelings of safety and love for victim survivors, particularly for children and young people. 
Workers also highlighted the role of animals in supporting victim survivors well-being by reducing feelings of isolation and preventing suicide and self-harm. And there's a beautiful quote from Tali. Thank you so much again, Tali, for sharing your story with us and sharing your lived expertise, which has informed our report so much. And you'll also find um, Tali's expertise and story in our report, along with another survivor advocate story, Jake. Given that people have a, such a strong connection to their animals and animals are at risk of domestic and family violence from a perpetrator, it is unsurprising that 48% of workers said that clients have delayed leaving a perpetrator by more than a year due to fear or threat of an animal being harmed. 42% of workers also said that victim survivors have delayed leaving a perpetrator again for more than a year, but due to barriers to accessing support related to their animals. So what are these barriers to support? Workers noted that there are a whole range of different barriers to accessing support that people with animals face, including a lack of animal friendly rental, emergency, crisis, transitional and long term accommodation, as well as a lack of funds to pay for interim solutions like boarding for animals. There is also the fear of separation from animals, including uh, for not only for clients, but also for children. For logistical reasons, particularly for people living in regional and rural areas, um, there may be difficulties in transporting animals, particularly larger animals. There's a fear of animal abuse not being taken seriously and not being believed. And finally, animals can also be registered in the perpetrator's name and that can create issues as well. Of the 54 workers who work in organisations that provide accommodation, only 16 stated they can accommodate people with animals in certain circumstances, including in high risk, um, where a person's at high risk of experiencing violence or experiencing more severe violence, that is. Organisations were sometimes able to accommodate dogs, cats, fish, small mammals and reptiles only 19% of workers said their organisation accommodates assistance animals of people with disability. And no organisation, so not a single organisation, was able to accommodate larger animals. Whilst that's not surprising, it really shows that we need another way and a solution to this, because 45% of workers for the same survey said that they had clients who had experienced domestic and family violence who were connected to larger animals, such as horses. And that's a barrier to leaving a violent perpetrator. So where can people refer? Well, 43% of domestic and family violence and community workers said they did not know where to refer people with animals experiencing domestic and family violence. For workers who do refer, referrals are made to the RSPCA, to DV West, DVSM, Dignity, Pause and Recover, which is a volunteer run organization, as well as a number of animal welfare organizations, including Animal Welfare League, Lucy's Project, and local shelters, rescues, and veterinary clinics. In terms of risk assessments and safety planning, 35% of workers say they always include animals experiencing violence when they're undertaking risk assessments and safety planning with, safety planning with victim survivors. 40% will usually or sometimes include animals. However, 11% rarely do and 14% of workers never do. So what would assist workers to support people with animals experiencing domestic and family violence? Workers said that additional specific funding to accommodate animals would help a lot. Training on how to respond, including referral pathways and safety planning 
tailored guidance for their service, support to build relationships with their local RSPCA, shelters and vets, and resources to increase victim survivor and community awareness of the issues and the supports available. We also asked workers about whether victim survivors had been in contact with animal welfare agencies or veterinary professionals. And 57% of workers said that victim survivors had sometimes, usually, or always been in contact with vets, the RSPCA, or another animal welfare organisation while they and their animal were experiencing domestic and family violence. 22% of workers said they were not sure, but this 22% also correlates with the workers who never or rarely ask about animals in conversations with clients. So the frequency of victim survivors being in contact with vets and animal welfare organisations may well be higher. And how about people and animals living in rural, regional and outer metropolitan areas? Well, people experiencing domestic and family violence living in rural, regional and outer metropolitan areas are more likely to be connected to larger animals, such as horses, and the barriers to accessing temporary crisis, medium and long-term housing can be exacerbated in regional and rural areas. Perpetrators are also more likely to have greater access to guns, um, which highlights uh, or which increases the risk to people and animals. Indeed, two of the three highest risk factors for homicide related to domestic and family violence, as Delia mentioned earlier, are threats to kill or harm an animal, as well as access to weapons. Urgent reforms are needed so that we can ensure that people living in rural, regional and outer metropolitan areas can access the supports they need to be safe. So based on our survey findings, we've made 12 recommendations in our report for law policy and practice change. What I'm sharing with you now are very high level summaries of our recommendations, and you can find more detail about them in our report. Our first recommendation is to provide culturally safe, accessible and appropriate community education about animals and people experiencing domestic and family violence to train workers across a range of sectors to understand the issue of people and animals experiencing domestic and family violence and where to refer them for support. Because as we've heard from Tali, there are so many opportunities to provide early support that are often missed and this needs to change. We can also train people working with animals to recognize and respond to domestic and family violence and to refer animals and people to support services. And I note that EDVOS in Victoria is already doing this work um, and we've referenced their work in our report. So you can learn more about that um, if, you, if you go to the report after the launch. We're also recommending that we resource organisations working with victim survivors and perpetrators to provide animals and people experiencing domestic and family violence with the range of supports that they need to be safe. And we should also be resourcing cross-sector collaboration across the domestic and family violence and animal welfare sector to develop solutions to improve the safety of animals and people experiencing domestic and family violence because it's become so clear to us through our research that the safety of people and animals experiencing domestic and family violence is very much interconnected. And it's so wonderful that today we have so many of you joining us from across those sectors. We're also recommending that we resource support networks for animals and people experiencing domestic and family violence in rural, regional and outer metropolitan areas. And here I note that Lucy's project has been doing work, um, is, is already doing work on this um, and has been leading a lot of work on this. So we've also referenced Lucy, Lucy's project's work in our report. And I'd recommend that you have a look at their website as well. We also need to increase access to long-term housing for people with animals. 
been really clear to us throughout survey that that is one of the most significant barriers to people leaving a violent perpetrator. We need to provide the options and supports to all people with animals experiencing domestic and family violence to stay safely in their homes if they wish to. There is a staying home leaving violence program in New South Wales and similar programs across Australia. However, they're not always accessible to all people experiencing violence, including people with disability and LGBTIQ people. And it's essential that they are because particularly with all the barriers to accessing um, animal friendly accommodation, if people are able to stay in their home safely, then that would be one way of overcoming that barrier to leaving a violent perpetrator. We're also recommending that we enable people with animals experiencing domestic and family violence to maintain and access rental accommodation if they wish to, um, to maintain and access social and community housing if they wish to, and also to be able to access affordable housing and crisis accommodation if they wish to. Finally, we've also made recommendations to improve legal protections and law enforcement responses, including expanding laws that protect people experiencing domestic and family violence to protect animals too, as well as resourcing law enforcement and animal welfare agencies to collaborate so that they can improve the safety of animals and people experiencing domestic and family violence by working together. There is another story um, of a survivor advocate, Jake, in our report that really highlights how crucial it is that there is this cross-sector collaboration. And I'd really um, recommend that you read Jake's story because he really, um, really does illuminate this issue for us. Finally, we also asked about the impacts of the COVID-19 crisis on people and animals experiencing domestic and family violence. In July 2020, workers had already observed that the impacts of the COVID-19 crisis included increased sexual, domestic or family violence against the clients, as well as increased sexual, domestic or family violence against the animals as well in some cases. Increased complexity of client needs, that's come through really strongly and we keep hearing that from our member services that are specialist domestic and family violence services that the crisis has just made it um, more difficult because there are so many uh, increased and intersecting needs now. There are also decreased access to income, food and essentials as well as referral pathways and uh, veterinary services and boarding. What this tells us is that there really is an urgent need to act on the recommendations in our report because the impacts of the COVID-19 crisis are already um, exacerbating the risks of violence for victim survivors. So in summary, our report found that the safety and well-being of animals and people experiencing domestic and family violence are highly interconnected and that perpetrators use many types of domestic and family violence against animals and people. And 55% of workers said that victim survivors had disclosed the perpetrator killed an animal or animals. 48% of workers said victim survivors had delayed leaving by more than a year because of a fear or threat of an animal being harmed. And 42% had delayed leaving a perpetrator for more than a year because of barriers to accessing support related to their animals. The impacts of violence against animals on people, including children, are extreme and can include long-term trauma, psychological, emotional and physical harm. And what's really important to remember as well is that animals are a source of emotional and psychological support and love for human victim survivors, including children and young people. So our overall, uh, overarching recommendation that's based on the findings of our report and all of the lived expertise that's been shared with us and the expertise of other organizations is that we need to improve access to a range of supports for people and animals experiencing domestic and family violence to ensure their safety and their well-being 
and also prioritize responses that will enable people and animals experiencing domestic and family violence to stay together wherever possible to support their healing and recovery. Thank you so much again for joining us and um, please do share this report that will provide a link to the report um, in the chat box. And we've also got a survey as we'd love your suggestions on organizations or people that we should work with to continue our advocacy to improve the safety of people and animals. And we'd also love to hear your feedback on the recommendations. So if you could take um, a few minutes to fill out the survey, we'd really appreciate that. And now I'm going to pass back to Delia, who is going to welcome um, an, our next speaker. Before I do, I'd like to just comment on that Tali's cat looks happy. That's been a real big comment today. <laughs> but no, thank you, Moni. That was absolutely exceptional. And big thanks to everyone involved. This is such a meaningful piece of work with so much evidence and data and story. So thank you again, Moni. That was wonderful. And um, as Monique said, everyone do make sure you read that report and this um, is being recorded as well so you can see those high level points that Monique has shared. So without further ado, I um, really, really excitedly welcome um, the wonderful Trish Doyle, Shadow Minister for the Prevention of Domestic Violence and Shadow Minister for Women to share her thoughts with us. Welcome and thank you, great to see you Trish. Thanks Delia and um, hello everyone. Um, can I first also um, acknowledge uh, the traditional owners of the land on which we all uh, meet, um, we all individually sit. I'm very, very proud in the Blue Mountains here to uh, represent the Darug and the Gundungurra peoples. Um, so I pay my respect to Elders past um, and present. Um, and a big shout out to the fabulous team at DV New South Wales, um, it always amazes me um, that you bring with a sense of gentleness but authority so much critical information um, from the sector um, into the space uh, that many of us um, parliamentarians occupy um, and, and tell important stories and provide important information for change. So uh, thanks Monique, thanks Renata. Um, thanks, Pip. Thanks, the entire DV New South Wales team. Delia, you must be very proud of your team um, and everyone who has participated in pulling together this excellent report. Um, Tali, thank you for bravely sharing um, your story um, with, with such power. Um, so bravery and power, thank you. It's what we need for those, uh, those personal stories to inform change, legislative change. Um, hello to my other colleagues who are here, Emma Hurst and to Danielle, um, hello. And I know that uh, Hayley Foster for Women's Safety, New South Wales is out there in the audience as well. Thanks to all of those who work at the front line. Um, every opportunity I get, I wanna thank those who respond to um, the crises that uh, many families find themselves in, in domestic violence and abuse. Um, but all of those who are working so hard on preventative measures as well. It's a really tough space to work. Um, so I just want to acknowledge that this year where so many of us actually feel quite weary, that we actually exist, um, we very much exist in the land of vicarious trauma. So um, thank you everyone. Um, I wanted to just say also, uh, for those who don't know, that um, I never imagined myself to be in the hallowed halls of Parliament. Um, as a child victim survivor of domestic violence myself and at various times throughout my life, um, my lifelong work being um, around domestic violence and sexual assault reform, I never imagined that, um, that I'd have the opportunity to make legislation. And I feel very honoured and very privileged to be in that space. And the day that um, I walk through the, the doors into the chamber and don't feel that privilege is the day I shouldn't be there. Um, when I was told that my hair was too messy and I was a bit rough around the edges and I came from the wrong side of the tracks and I didn't fit the image um, of a parliamentarian, I shouldn't run as a candidate, that challenged me and I thought, well, you watch me. So, um, so here I am. Uh, I want to, um, Tali, I want to just touch on a point that you make about uh, ways in which we live 
and that we have to live um, coming out of uh, domestic violence situations, especially as a child, when there's a pet involved. Um, so as a young girl, um, I lived uh, in and out of the car with my family. Um, we couch surfed with friends um, and, and when mum was hospitalised, we, us kids spent a considerable amount of time in an orphanage of sorts. Um, and it was that last option um, in an orphanage where we couldn't have our dog um, that I remember the most because it wasn't so much mum being in hospital, it was not having our dog um, that really rocked my world. Um, I wanted to thank you for the report, DV New South Wales, for the recommendations that make a lot of sense. I think for people who um, exist in the community, who work in the sector, uh, victim survivors of domestic and family violence, you know, we often look at reports, we look at material that's provided to us, we look at recommendations in, in hundreds of reports. And I did an interview yesterday with a, um, an academic and I've got 17 reports around domestic violence, different elements about domestic violence sitting on my desk at the moment. Um, the recommendations make sense and there's a degree of frustration and Emma Hurst will agree with me here that we, we don't see reform and we don't see legislative change as, as quickly as it should happen. But um, we have to hold on to a glimmer of hope that things are changing. And like you, Tali, I was the little girl who stood at the door when the police turned up and said, hey, uh, they said to my um, drunken, violent father, hey, look, we'll just take you up the pub for a few beers, mate, until she and the kids calm down. And you don't see that kind of response. Um, uh, some people might experience that, but as a matter of course, that is not the response that our police service um, would provide these days. Um, and it's not perfect, but it's not, that is not the standard anymore. So I feel, I feel good that we are taking steps. Um, I also feel very proud to work alongside across, um, uh, across the political spectrum with all manner of people who want to see change in this sector. Um, and we have heard from uh, the minister. Um, it's it's a quite unusual for the minister and the shadow minister to be in the same space, but over the last year or so that I've been the shadow minister, he and I often have been. Um, he's not a combative person. He wants to see change. Um, and whilst ideologically we might sit in different camps, I think there is a very genuine um, desire to see change. Um, it's my job as a shadow minister to put pressure on the government, to hold them to account. Um, and so uh, whilst I welcome uh, his legislation, the Stronger Communities legislation, and I'll be speaking to this in the parliament next week, um, I don't think it goes far enough. And so I will stand up in the parliament and I'll speak to the, the extra provisions I think that that piece of legislation should have. Um, I'm also very proud to um, be asked to sit on the Joint Select Committee looking at coercive control legislation. I feel honoured and privileged to do that as a parliamentarian, as the shadow minister, but also there is that very personal pride to Tali that you spoke of. When you know it, when you've lived it, when it's been who you are and the very core of your sense of social justice, it actually drives you in a way that's different to many other people. Um, Tali also talked about the holistic view around um, uh, prevention of and response to domestic violence that looks at accommodation, looks at, looks at animals as as not just being something in our lives, they are family members. Um, and I think that uh, what I will be doing, continue to do, and I'll finish up on this note, um, is to say to the government, hey, uh, you brought in a range of reforms. You ironically entitled them staying home, leaving violence reforms. But the thing is, uh, many, many families don't have the option of staying at home. And when they do leave, there's nowhere to go. There is not enough accommodation. Um, and I would like to see government at state and federal level actually pump money into, you know, responding to COVID and recessions. Um, 
uh, and, and particularly domestic violence, not because of the pandemic, but because they care about victim survivors and they want a better society. And money shouldn't just be about hard hats and high-vis vests in terms of the recession. It should be about social infrastructure that uh, provides that housing that you've been talking about today and that this report speaks to so comprehensively. We need money for case management, for services across the board. Money has to be supplied so that when someone reaches out and they've got a whole range of needs, and one of those might be um, about, you know, being safe somewhere with your family pets um, mm -hmm. or with the, the farm animals and removing the perpetrator. Um, there has to be a, a case manager in those services to help wrap the support around uh, the, the victim survivors. We need money pumped into education resources. We can't rely on women's health centres just off uh, from goodwill walking into our local high schools and talking to students about what constitutes a healthy relationship. If we want legislative change, we need money alongside it pumped into preventative measures. We need our kids growing up in schools learning about what is a healthy relationship and what's not. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. Sorry. We've got three minutes. Yeah. So sorry. 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 I'll, finish, I'll finish off just by saying that um, at a number of really tough times in, in recent years, because I, you know, I'm a human as well as a parliamentarian, um, it's my dog Snoopy and Zip that have been the mainstay and a support in my own life. So I hear what you're saying, Tali. Thank you, DV New South Wales. Um, Let's, uh, let's get on to legislation um, reform, which incorporates your recommendations. Thank you. Brilliant. You rock, Trish. Thank you so much. And now moving on to the, um, Emma Hurst, who's been absolutely incredible um, for the Animal Justice Party and advocating for animals and people experiencing domestic and family violence. Thank you, Emma. And so sorry, everyone. We've literally got a few minutes left. Thank you. That's totally yeah. fine. That's totally fine. I'm in the middle of an inquiry today, so I'm just diving in here quickly, um, just because I'm I'm just so happy that DV New South Wales prepared this report and put in the work in this space because it is a space that um, has been overlooked for so long. Uh, in February this year, the Animal Justice Party held a roundtable in New South Wales Parliament, which included DV New South Wales, along with other DV services, with survivors, with the RSPCA, with the police, with vets, with tenants union, um, with, with anyone that we thought could be of value to help us really nut out what are the gaps in this area? What legislation changes can and should we be making? Um, and um, Monique was there and I'm sure she'd be able to attest to the fact that, you know, we didn't really get any kind of um, black and white response. There was not one thing that would help solve a lot of these situations, but there was a lot of areas where we knew that we could get improvement on. Um, and so that really sort of started that work with the Attorney General and led to some of the legislative changes that we're seeing now. Um, there is an ongoing consultation process in this particular area of the link between domestic violence and animal abuse. Um, so we're hoping to see more come through. We, we, we actually agree with um, um, uh, my my friend Trish Doyle, who, who did say that more needs to be done. Um, you know, this is a really good start, what we're looking at, um, but it, it doesn't go far enough and there is more to do. Um, but we do recognise, of course, that the Attorney General has been so open to this process um, and certainly hasn't closed the door to see more changes in this area. Um, and, and some of the legislative changes that we're seeing now, I mean, this report is fantastic. It would have been great to have before our roundtable, but now it's going to just be almost like a, a guide for us to be able to work out exactly what we need to be doing. Um, and some of the legislative changes that are identified through this report um, in regard to recognising animals as victims of domestic and family violence in their own right um, and identifying them as persons in domestic violence legislation is so important. Um, this was something that really came up very strongly um, in our interactions and communications with victims and survivors of domestic violence is that um, animals are still being considered property under the law and fall under property disputes in courts. And of course, courts don't prioritise property disputes. Um, now, we, now, anybody that has an animal in their family will be able to tell you that nobody considers 
their dog or a cat to should have the same legal right as a table or a chair. Um, animals are not a piece of property. Um, they're members of the family. And so it's just absolutely so important to recognise it, particularly in this space, um, because we're seeing animals fall under property disputes. Um, we also support the legislative changes put forward about making the use of animals as tools of domestic and family violence a separate offence. Um, that wasn't something that came out of the round table, but that is something that has come specifically out of this report, which I think is going to be really useful going forward. Um, and of course, all the information around resourcing. Um, there has been a small grant given um, to help upgrade refuges to ensure that they're animal friendly, um, but there's so much more that needs to be done, particularly in regional and rural areas, um, and it's particularly around the program of staying home, leaving violence. Um, and, and that has a very specific link to, again, regional and rural communities where um, it's very difficult to leave with animals, um, where you've got horses or you've got multiple large dogs, um, where you've got, um, you know, potentially 100 animals of a particular species, um, the situation just becomes more and more difficult. And so we need to recognise that as well. So thank you again to DV New South Wales. And thank you so much for having me here today. Um, we will continue our work in this space. And um, if there's any groups or any individuals that are also listening into this that want to get further involved with the work that the Animal Justice Party is doing in this space, then please do reach out. Well, we certainly look forward to working closely with you, Emma, and thanks for everything you've done today. And I think everyone in this group and, and attending today can carry on with the advocacy and, and the legacy of all the work done so far. Thank you. So last and certainly not least, um, Councillor Danielle Wheeler from Abigail Boyd's Office, The Greens. I'm really looking forward to hearing from you today as well, Danielle. Great to see you online. Thank you. Thanks, Delia. Um, I want to acknowledge that I'm on um, Darug land out in, um, in outer Western Sydney, um, next door to Trish, actually. Um, <laughs> um, thanks for inviting us today. Abigail's really sorry that she can't be here and she's asked me to say a few words on her behalf, which I shall try to do really quickly. Um, this is a really important and impressive piece of work. We've long known about the links between animal abuse and domestic violence, especially coercive control. This report improves society's understanding of these links and provides an important evidence base with clear and well-supported recommendations for legislative changes and inclusions in the New South Wales budget. I want to address two recommendations specifically. Recommendation 11, which calls for changes to the New South Wales Crimes Act. It's becoming increasingly clear that our laws are out of date, out of touch with community sentiment and do not provide safety for victim survivors or their animals. There is a clear correlation between animal cruelty and, and domestic abuse, but our laws do not explicitly recognise this link and are dangerously inadequate in their response to both animal cruelty and domestic abuse. The Greens believe that we must urgently overhaul our animal cruelty laws to bring them into line with community expectations, criminalise patterns of coercive and controlling behaviours in domestic and family contexts, including those that include threats and violence towards animals, and recognise that neither of these horrific crimes occur in a vacuum. Further, our provision of support services remains dangerously inadequate, despite the repeated warnings of stakeholders. It's time we, sorry, it's time we funded domestic violence support services and accommodation like we were in the middle of an emergency, because we are. Recommendation 10 makes specific reference to the use of economic stimulus funding to construct 50,000 new social housing properties over 10 years. The Greens enthusiastically support this call. Safe, affordable housing is life-changing and a worthy socially responsible use of stimulus funding. Abigail's asked me to specifically pass on her thanks for your detailed and impressive research and your unfaltering and continued advocacy in this area. And she offers her support on behalf of herself and all of the Greens to see these recommendations implemented. And now I'm gonna quickly change hats uh, from policy advisor to an MP to a Greens councillor. Uh, so I'm an elected councillor on Hawkesbury City Council. Councils often fill the gaps left by state and federal governments. Greens councillors across New South Wales are continuing to advocate for refuges and emergency accommodation within local areas. To allow women to keep their children and pets with them, my own LGA has no emergency accommodation uh, in the LGA. You have to go um, to either to Penrith or Blacktown. Um, uh, subsidised boarding facilities and council animal shelters and liaison with animal rescue organisations so people leaving violence don't have to leave their pets behind or incur really large fees or surrender their pets to find safe accommodation or to, or to avoid alerting the perpetrator due to microchip registration. 
and we know that that's a that's a big problem um, in in our LGA. Through our local councillor network, local groups and MPs, we can work with support services to help roll out the recommendations contained in this report. Uh, and across local um, government areas within New South Wales and amplify your voice in local and state campaigns. I wanna particularly acknowledge a statement that Tali made that this is a solvable problem. I think that's really important and it puts us on notice. Thank you again for this really important piece of work and all your work supporting vulnerable people and animals in New South Wales. The Greens stand firmly with you in this campaign to see these recommendations enacted. Thank you. Thank you, Danielle, and we stand with you and everyone here. I want to say a huge thank you to everyone who's been part of this really important conversation. And I'm also stealing Tali's comment about this being solvable. There's 12 recommendations that we can absolutely implement. I'm just going to hand you over to Moni because we finalise and wrap up. And thank you again, everyone, for the engagement, interaction and all the comments. And let's keep the advocacy up. Thanks so much, Delia. Thank you so much, Tali, Trish, Danielle, Emma, and also to Mark for speaking today. It's been such a joy to have your support. Thank you everyone for joining us for this webinar and the launch of our report. Um, I'm going to post into the chat box, the link to the report that we'd love if you can share widely across your networks, as well as a link to the survey, uh, as we'd love to hear your feedback on the recommendations, and also to hear if you'd like to work together on this issue. Um, and also if you have any suggestions for other organizations that we should reach out to. So thanks so much again, everyone. It's, it's been a really, a real joy to be with you today and we look forward to staying in touch. Take care.